Welcome, everyone, to the second episode of Developer Dialogue. I am Jean, the Strategy Wargamer. I am here with my faithful co-host, Eric Tortuga Power. And today we have the head of Lock and Load Publishing, David, on the show. Welcome, David. How are you doing? How are you doing, guys? Eh, Thanks for having me. Oh, man, it's our pleasure. (laughs) This is our uh, first live actual interview episode. Uh, so I think, I don't know how many interview episodes we did between this uh, show and Single Mall Strategy. Um, I think it's probably been a couple of dozen. And so we decided to actually go live, so to include the community. So in this uh, interview episode, we actually have the community in our chat. And throughout the episode, we're going to um, recite their questions and uh have community interaction in the interview for the first time. So this is a little bit exciting. Hey, this is new to me. I, I'm not a big Discord guy, so you guys are going to have to bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was talking with David behind, uh, before the show, and I was just like, you know, I came from the ICQ days, so I didn't know anything about Discord until, like, uh, I think probably like six months ago. Is this like, mm-hmm. I wonder, is Discord like a, uh, George Google, you would know better. Is Discord like just recently came out like a year or two ago? Is this like a new thing where it's been around forever and we just kind of stumbled into it now? Oh, I mean, I'm not an expert, but it's been around for many years already. Huh. I'm, I've yeah, been it's been myself. around for a while. My kids use it all the time. Oh. Yeah, probably, maybe I've been using it for three years. Oh, okay. So it's kind of like Two. what, uh, the young youngsters are using and... <laughs> For us older people, we're not used to it. It's the new IRC. Yeah. I yeah, I would days. agree with that. Yeah, I miss IRC. Those are real good days. <laughs> um, so, David, welcome on the show. I, uh, I'm i really excited to have you on. I am a big fan uh, of a lot of your uh, board games. Um, my friends have a, a whole slew of them. And uh, I, unfortunately, because of the pandemic... Um, I haven't been able to actually uh, get together with every, uh, with any of them and actually play. So uh, I started kind of like uh, going through your digital catalog, and I've been surprised about how many titles you have on Steam, and it's it's quite a bit. Yeah, we, we well, I've been my previous company was Matrix Games, and a lot of people don't realize that. Um, I founded that company and ran it for about 10, 12 years. Sold it, took a break, and then um, ended up buying Lock and Load. I didn't know that, and that's why I'm, one of the reasons why I'm really excited to be doing this interview with you. Look at all the fantastic titles that publisher has produced. When you were involved with uh, Matrix, were you doing mostly publishing work, or were you on the developer side at all? Uh, a little bit of both, actually. Mostly the publishing work, but um, Matrix was, um, honestly, it was a, a joke when we started. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> we, we, had, we had a website. Um, called um what was it called um it was it was a basic review site um and i can't remember the name of it believe it or not um and we had come to the conclusion that you know we enjoyed doing it war games was not a big popular um subject with people on the on the internet you know on the web and um we said you know anyone can copy what we're doing we need to do something different and um we were big fans of ssi and joe billings gary grisby and um I happened to know them, uh, chatted with them a little bit over the years, and um, we had got them to allow us to get the source code to Steel Panthers. And um, that's really what started the whole thing off. And the object, the idea was they were going to make a new Steel Panthers SSI, and um, they said we could take the source code and do anything we want with it, but we could not sell it. And we said, fine, no problem. And um, it it became a big hit. It was on front of PC Gamer some issue years later, um, and you know it wasn't me. It was a lot of great guys working as a team, you know, doing it for fun. And when we were done that, we turned it into Matrix Games. It's basically um, the name came from the movie The Matrix. We just I thought <laughs> that was a great concept. <laughs> nice. And I was always wondering. That's great. Yeah, no, that's where it came from. The, I like the idea that the code was embedded into everything. And uh, we always thought that was a good idea. And that's how it started. And um, the timing was perfect in the sense that it was just at that point that I believe Talonsoft got bought out by, I don't know who bought them out, but some big video game publisher, which in my opinion, I don't see why they would have cared about Talonsoft um, outside of, you know, just more 
assets on their books. And then SSI got bought out by a French big game company, which doesn't like war games. They don't like to make games with violence. So oh, wow. again, don't know why they bought SSI. So you lost the two largest software developers making war games. Um, John Killer was part of Talonsoft at the time. So that really, uh, he ended up uh, eventually going on his own. And um, Matrix Games was basically left standing just by default. No one knew who we were, so there was no one to pick on them. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious, Did because uh, Matrix Games, I know has been around a while. Did Was Matrix Games come after Slytherin? Because I know Slytherin and Matrix Games are um, owned by the same... Uh, company. So I, I was just yeah. wondering uh, if Slytherin came after or how, how that all worked out. I'm pretty sure Matrix was first and then Slytherin came afterwards. And for a while we worked together and um, I was uh, moving from New York to Colorado. And I was running out of, uh, I guess, steam to want to do this. Um, you know, some of the guys want to do Xbox games and I was like, I don't want to do Xbox. And um, so they bought it. I left. Uh, after about a year, maybe two, and I took a break, and then I bought Lock and Load. So uh, I'm pretty sure Matrix is first. What inspired you to uh, buy Lock and Load? What was the uh, uh, what was your motivation? What was your inspiration? Did you ever hear the uh, the slogan "Whiskeys and bi- Bad Ideas"? Uh, I think so. <laughs> I think it speaks for itself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had a friend of mine. Well, I, I was starting a, another software company, and we were playing board games in the conference room of my, my offices. This is after I left Matrix. And um, the guy who owned um, Lock and Load, for those who don't know, when I owned Matrix, the gentleman who made Lock and Load Publishing, um, and his name is Mark Walker, he uh, came to us and we made his, I think his second or third board game. He had originally made a game called Forgotten Heroes, I think Anzac Attack, and he was in, into board games. We then went and developed our very first board game, which was called um, Band of Heroes, I think it's what we called it. And it was the World War II version of his board game. And um, anyway, over the years, uh, he came around and said, hey, you know, i like to um, kind of buy my rights back. I want to do what you're doing with computer games. So board games, I said yes. And he went off and did his thing. And then years later, he came back and wanted to know if I wanted to buy it. And I actually said, nah, I don't want to do board games. I did that when I was right out of high school. It, that's horrible business. You know? <laughs> the whole production thing is, is, is you know, crazy. Now, granted, you're talking in the mid-80s, so thinking and everything has changed quite a bit. But, you know, it's still a lot more work to me than computer games. I would have thought, like, board games would be um, easier to make than uh, computer games. Well, there's two benefits to a computer game. Once you're ready, you release. And once it's done, we were the first company to offer a digital download. And uh, I had people complaining, oh, I'm never going to buy a downloadable game. I, I, I want, they actually said this to me. I want to lift the box and feel the weight of the manual. And I was like, that's ridiculous. I said, you know, download the game, play it right there. You can probably download the game faster. You can make a sandwich. And, you know, now, of course, everyone does. It, and it's considered ridiculous to go into a store anymore. But um, when we did that, when you do that with a game, once it's up on the server, I mean, what's the other cost? I mean, yeah, there's bandwidth and there's a server cost, but you don't have to produce anything. You don't have to make boxes. You don't have to really make manuals. You're done. And if there's any mistake, you spelt the guy's name wrong, you needed to make a patch, all you got to do is make a patch, and you're fully ready to go. In a board game, it's very unforgiving when you make a mistake. (laughs) Yeah, because then you would have physical materials, and uh, if you needed to add something, that would be... Uh, I've seen some of the uh, pictures from uh, a lot of the board game uh, publishers that I follow, and I see like their stores, and they have like tons and tons of boxes of some of my favorite games, and I love it, but if uh, you run into something like what's going on now with the pandemic... Um, you know, you might have a lot of stock for quite a while. Um, that's actually one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, um, since the pandemic started, did you, has your digital titles kind of surged while your uh, board game titles kind of uh, not so much? Actually, no. Uh, our sales went kind of, I don't know, I'm not going to say through the roof, but it, it went up a, such a major market share. Um I think part of the reason is um, people are stuck inside. So now, you know, you used to go to dinner and go to the movies and maybe go to a concert. Well, all that money, assuming you didn't lose your job, of course, 
it's sitting in your pocket now. So buy, if you're into war games and tabletop games, buying games is, um, you know, a great way to spend your money for something that's a, a hobby oriented thing. The computer games took off. I mean, we did phenomenal with the computer games we released. Um, and I think two twofold. One, everyone's locked in the house and we made it extremely cheap. We made it, I oh, think, yeah. um, $3, $4, something like that. Um, we wanted people to be able to play the game. And at $5, we knew there was going to be some bugs and things to work out because we really weren't ready 100%. And we clearly said so with the early access from Steam. And um, the public seemed to love it. I mean, they really seemed to eat it up. We also started writing books for our board games. And um, the, the, the whole object is to basically, you know, picture Star Wars, Star Trek. What, what do we love about that? You can get audiobooks, paperback books, TV shows, movies. And then you've got how many different movies and or series to get if you're into Star Trek or into Star Wars for that matter. We're trying to bring that a little bit back to our hobby where there's books on our games. So there's characters that are counters in the game, uh, stories. They don't necessarily match the, the games. In other words, it's not like we're taking the scenario and writing a story about the scenario. We are writing stories that may have a scenario, but it's not necessarily what's going to happen in the game. And again, it's just people are telling me, yeah, I have to go to work. I'm on the bus. And they're listening to this audio book that we made. And uh, so in that in that way, you know, we're trying to make a, a cartoon for World of War 85 that's going to be story driven. And um, we've even talked to some um, people about space infantry. And um, again, it's just to broaden the horizon. I think I think today's day and age with kids and board games. I mean, I have 24, 22 and a 17 year old and um, my 17 year old. He'll play board games. My 22-year-old, well, my 24-year-old, nah, you really have to drag him to the table. But our company, Lock and Load Now, is really designed to bring young people as well as the committed already to playing it. I would say we have two or three girls in the office who play Lock and Load Tactical, and they're in high school slash college. And um, people look at me, but how'd you do that? And the whole object of Lock and Load with the starter kits and anything else we want you to play the game. That's all there is to it. Yet you can download a lot of the stuff for free. You can play it. If it's not your cup of tea, I don't want your money. Because what good is getting your money and you're not enjoying yourself? You're not going to buy anything else. Um, but if you get the stuff and you try and you say, wow, I got the computer game. That was great. I tried the board game with this down, free download kit. Um, or I bought the counters with the download kit. It, I think it's the accessibility of our products that are making us so successful now. Now, you mentioned you're putting this stuff on Steam. It's kind of been an interesting transition to watch the war games slowly dip their toes onto the Steam platform. But I've seen that, I mean, just using Matrix Games as an example, a lot of their stuff isn't on Steam. And I think that Slytherin, I, don't, I can't really tell, but it seems like Slytherin has really pushed for everything to go onto Steam. Um, so what, what led you to the Steam platform or how did that decision get made on the lock and load publishing end? Well, when I was at Matrix, we tried to get on Steam. And back in the day, Steam was very much not wanting publishers that like us on Steam. Uh, they wanted to get the, the bigger publishers on there because obviously more and more people. Remember back when Steam came out, you could buy this, the, uh, what is it, the little access key. When you went to Walmart and bought your game, whatever that may have been, you had an access key and you had to join Steam with their access key to play oh, your game. Right. You know that? Yeah, so it, it, it's been it's really been a transition of everybody. Everyone has moved away from the GameStops and electronic boutiques if they even exist anymore. Um, and those chain stores now you can go into them and you'll be hard pressed to find a single computer game. Now I know there's a few that uh, what's that monster role playing game? Uh, it's Elder Scrolls. Uh, what was the one? Yeah, you'll find a few of those in those stores, but you're never going to find, I mean, what made me brought game, what made me make matrix bring the games here download was because, um, the trying boutique, they would charge you quite a bit of money. I won't say how much just to keep it private, but you know, people can go on vacation for that money, <laughs> you know, and that money was used to advertise in their brochure that your game was coming. And then what they would do is they would buy games from you and then tell you, okay, you have to sell 350 to 500 copies per week. 
And if you don't, what they would do is they would drop your game price down $10. So to give you a really good insight, if you were selling a game for 50 bucks, you would sell it to them at least a 50% off. So we'll just say 50% off to make my math simple. Okay. It was really more between 50 and 65%, somewhere in that range. Okay. So they're, they're now buying the game from you for $25 a piece. And they may order 10,000 games, 3,000 games. Let's say that first week or after that first week, you only sell 250 copies. Well, they will then go and reduce the cost of your game by $10. Now, they bought, using this example, 1,000 games from you, 5,000 games, whatever the number we want to pick. You only sold 500 in the first week. So they have, let's just say, 4,500 left. Well, they now reduced your price that they were going to pay you, not 25 it's going to go down another $10. And if you say no, you're like, well, send me back my games. Well, they don't send you back the games. They throw them out. Okay. And this is, and this was the whole, um, now remember, they were the, really the only game in town. If, they did, if you didn't know who uh, Matrix was or Lock and Load is now, you would know where to go or buy them. And remember, buying things over the internet wasn't a common practice and there was no Amazon yet or it was in inf infancy at best. So you really were, you know, shackled into this. And um, I found I was given 60 to 70% of my income away before I gave it to a single developer or myself just so I could be on the shelf from a China boutique. Wow, that's insane. That makes uh, Steam's, I think, 30% uh, seem... <laughs> I, 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 I'm a big fan of Steam. I know some people are afraid what happens if, um, you know... Steam goes out of business. I'll lose all my game. I mean, I have hundreds, and I mean hundreds of games on Steam, okay? And I look at that the same way I worry about nuclear war. If some reason <laughs> the nuclear war goes off, you know, I guess it really doesn't matter anymore. And, I, and my guess is with the library that Steam has, if they were ever for any reason going to go out of business outside of a, an economic world crisis, <laughs> you know, somebody would buy it out to keep it going. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and, I, and I really think if not someone would do something to release the keys or hack the keys. I mean, you know, there's, look at all the things that's happened just in the last 20 years. Yeah, I, I could totally see that. You know, if Steam shuts down, I can imagine a whole bunch of uh, uh, hackers and such to probably uh, find a way to download it and probably make a repository or something like that. And, and look at, what is it, good old gamers, I think they're called? Mm -hmm. GOG? I mean, they do the same thing Steam does, but with no copy protection. And... I really think the only reason they're more, not more successful is developer publishers are more afraid of their products not having any protection on it. Hmm. That's right. I really do like good old games. That, yeah, GOG. For you know, they they like they fix up some of the old game titles too, and they'll include. Patches. Oh yeah, beautiful stuff. The Star Wars, old Star Wars games that we used to be out there, they're great. Um, good old games. I'm just, I you know, I wish they would make uh, sequels uh, to those games that Good Old Games uh, has been publishing, like Star Wars, uh, Star Trek, uh, those old games, like rebooting them or something like that, but more uh, new graphics, kind of like what they're doing with Command and Conquer. Yeah, you know, they they say that's an update, but it's really a rewrite because most of like the old game engines, even for the war games, they don't work anymore. You can't get them to work on certain operating systems anymore, like you know, Visual C and Visual Basic, the old old super old versions or whatever was out back then i think the original steel panthers was coded in something called watcom c which may be around but it doesn't work with the old code anymore so it has to be recoded hmm. so once you start recoding well then you might as well i mean one of the things that um our, one of our teams that was doing nations of war right now um, white star rising's out um we all had a meeting and they decided and i was really grateful for them to decide this to move it over to unity and it's not because we're going to do any 3D, you know, men jumping out of plane type of graphics, but it makes it so easy to provide a Linux edition, a Mac edition. I mean, the Mac edition from Windows is literally a button click. Okay. Yeah. I've been loving and, that because uh, you, uh, your lock and load um, uh, tactical digital is uh, available for both Apple um, for the Mac and for Windows. And I love that. When I first saw that, I was like, I already love this game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm a big Mac fan. I, I love everything Apple. I have Windows. My Windows runs better on my Mac. <laughs> <laughs> I finally have I finally have an ally. Tortuga is always, uh, Tortuga and uh, Matt always come at me for uh, having a Mac. <laughs> yeah, if, if you run if you run any type of I mean, people say Macs are so expensive, and they are. Don't get me wrong, but they last. I mean, 
I'm using what they used to what they call it a trash can. I've got windows on here. I got three, what is it, uh, 32 inch monitors on my desk. And um, I can run two windows and two Mac machines all at the same time, but not have miss a single beat on it. Historical gamer Matt and I, at least I won't speak for him, I'll speak for myself. We're just more leery of Jean's uh, love for mobile gaming and the App Store and all that because I'm, I'm just a PC type gamer. Doesn't matter if it's on a Mac or PC or Windows, but I, I just can't. I have never really gotten into the tablet gaming, uh, especially for war games. There are a few really good ones. Um, there was a Battle of the Bulge game. I think actually Matrix owns it now. Oh, yeah. And uh, Eric Lee Smith, uh, he designed it with a new company. He used to work at, uh, um, believe it or not, Victory Games. He did American Civil uh, Civil War game. He did um, quite a few, I mean, some classic. And one of them he got went off and did a computer company. And one of the best Bulge games I've ever played on an iPad. I think it's on, a, it's on the actual PC now and on a Mac. Uh, is their Bulge game. And they did um, a Moscow game, which was good. And then they did a North Africa one and a Gettysburg one. For some reason, they've stopped after the Gettysburg. And they never moved it to Mac, any of the other two. I don't know why. I remember uh, I uh, I actually got a opportunity to interview uh, Shenandoah's student. Yeah, that's the man. And uh, I went to their offices in Philly, I think, in 2014 to interview them. And they were designing um, the Gettysburg game. And he had a whole slew of titles that were going to come out under that engine. And then uh, I, I think like a year or two later, um, uh, something happened with the company uh, and Slytherin, I think, saved the game uh, and published it, I think, a year or two after that. So I was able to actually get the copy of the game and it was uh, it was an all right game. It was, uh, you know, it's it, it was all right. I played it for a little bit, but, um, you know, I, I, I never heard, I never found out what happened behind the scenes. So um, I know he was planning to publish like, three, four other games. He had multiple uh, Civil War battles um, in the pike for that. Well, you know, he went with Compass Games, Eric Lee Smith, and he really, my favorite Civil War game is a game by him, which was done by Victor Games called Across the Five Aprils. And um, it's just a phenomenal system, not hard to play, and you can play it down to the last physical turn die roll, which is really what's fun about these games. And he went and just released Across the Five Aprils, a new edition of through uh, Compass Games. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm kind of curious. So you mentioned the uh, that Battle of the Bulge game, and I remember playing that uh, for the first time, and it kind of uh, reminded me that I have a question regarding mobile. So I know Tortuga is going to cringe a little bit because uh, this is the least favorite topic. But um, So you published uh, multiple games on the Steam platform um, for both uh, Mac, Windows, and I even see Linux in there, which was awesome. I'm a huge Linux fan. And um, I'm kind of curious, have you ever decided to maybe port some of those games or dabble in the mobile space? Um, if you mean an iPad, yeah. I don't really believe that they would play well on an iPhone, for argument's sake, uh, just strictly because of the screen and the numbers you need to read. I don't, the object behind Lock and Loads games is to give you a digital board game. Not necessarily make a computer game. Um, I have found over my years when I was running Matrix that there's a lot of great programmers, but they're not necessarily great designers. And there's a lot of great designers that aren't programmers. And then there's people who are none of those, you know. <laughs> and um, we have found that, well, at least I feel that when you, because we have all these board games, that's why when you play our digital games, the counters are actually the counters in the game. And the maps are actually the maps in the game. Now, yes, we do computerize it and we do make sound effects and give you buttons to do certain things that you can't obviously do in a board game. Um, but when you bring try to do that onto a phone, I don't see how that's going to work. I don't, I don't, you don't have enough screen space. Um, iPad, the goal is once we're done, we are planning to bring it to the iPad. Um, but the sales of an iPad and mobile games for war games, not for mobile style games. The numbers aren't there that I can see and the people I've talked with um, and being Eric Lee Smith too for that. It's very hard to get those numbers up. And for a war game company to make money, enough money to do another game for the programmers, it has to sell these games a lot more money than the average mobile price line. I mean, when you see a game that's you know normally um, on the mobile line is what, $10? And that's probably kind of high, I guess. 
Yeah, and it's it's a really weird um, kind of uh, market because you know I know on the iPad and iPhone when somebody publishes a, a game and lists the price for like twenty dollars. A good example is like a uh, Company of Heroes. I think it's thirteen dollars on the iPad. And I'm fine with buying it for thirteen dollars because it's Company of Heroes. But a lot of like um, people I talk to is like thirteen dollars. I'm not spending thirteen dollars on an app, but yet they'll be willing to spend forty or fifty on um, a Nintendo Switch game. And I never got the kind of why not on the iPad, but on the Switch is fine. Well, it's conditioning. It's like anything else. I mean, my kids buy fifty, sixty dollar Xbox games. They don't care. Okay. <laughs> I don't care either, personally. You know, to me, man, sixty bucks, you know, big deal. Uh, it's a game. You know, as long as the game is worth playing, I really don't mind. And I think a lot of um, the um, you know, Angry Birds and all that, you play all that stuff, and you're paying a couple of bucks. <laughs> you get conditioned that, well, why should I pay more? I do believe the war gaming community, okay, or the strategy game community, um, they used to drop a hundred bucks for a game. Um, and I don't, I find that there's very little argument within that community. And most of those people are professionals, you know, the doctors, lawyers, accountants, servicemen. And as long as you're giving them a good game with good quality, you really won't get much gripe out of them. But if you're used to playing $20, $30 Euro games, I find it almost impossible that any of those people are going to buy a $7,500 board game. Yeah. I would think the pinnacle of that would be like War in the Pacific. So you mentioned two by three earlier. That's got to be. I think that's one of the most complex. You actually know more about board games than I do, but at least as far as PC board games go, it's the most complicated board game I've ever seen. So, I, I mean, Joe was doing that game with me. We, we, I remember him telling me play test in that game. He used to drive him crazy, man, because he would he would take him forever to play. And um, uh, that game literally has every plane that flies off a carrier deck or flies off an army base. There is an actual name pilot attached to that plane. Oh, wow. And, yeah, and so when you see those names, you're going to laugh, but you'll see all the real commanders, and then you'll see my name, kid's name. And the reason is because, you know, what happens if John F. Kennedy is killed, you know? Well, someone has to replace his name as the commander of that ship, okay? Or Pappy Bones, you know, pick you know, pick your, your person. So you have to have people that don't exist to replace the people that who die that and it's literally, I mean, that is a programming feat because you literally have every uh, every ship has a commander, every plane has a pilot, and uh, they are uh, literally, it's a real database of, of uh, people that actually fought during the war at those times. Find their grandfathers and fathers who served during World War II in the Pacific can find their names on certain things sometimes. Yes. I can only imagine how... <laughs> How in depth in making that game is? You probably had to go through like multiple books, and I mean, I can't even imagine that. That's like a Herculean task, right there. We we that game sold like gangbusters, and then they came up with the Admirals Edition, which added more complications to it. And um, it's one of the few Matrix games I can tell you I've never completed. In all honesty, I never got out of the second year of the war. Oh wow. I know Matt's doing a, a, um, a series on it, and I think he's been going on for like two, three years. And he says, I forgot, do you remember Tortuga House said, I think he said the rate they're going is going to take another 20 years or something like that. It was something oh, ridiculous. I think it'll be about 50 years if they go at the current pace. They've gone, uh, I think it's taken them two and a half years to go four months. <laughs> I mean, it probably is not going to spend, it's probably not going to take the full four years. But I mean, it, one turn... I don't know what the average turn is. Probably it's like two hours for a turn on that. And one turn is one day. So unless you can treat this as almost like a full-time job, it's harder to even do it faster than historical. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is definitely, um, I believe that's probably the most advanced computer game out there right now. Yeah, I'd agree. So, I mean, the East Front that they did, and I think I left, before, I left right after that came out or right before that came out, that is nowhere near as bad because there's nowhere near as many armies as there are planes and ships <laughs> in the Pacific. Yeah, I find that much more manageable. Um, it goes off the deep end again for me um, with the, the war in the West, which is, once again, introduces a pretty thick uh, aircraft dynamic, like you know, planning out your airstrikes and all that. So, well, I mean, I'd like to. I'd really like to do all these, but I feel like you have to really dedicate like a whole month of your life just to learning the game. 
Yeah, I mean, once you learn the game and play it, it, it does go pick up a little faster. But when you're playing all of China, all of the Southeast Asia, all of Australia, plus the Pacific, there's just so much stuff you have to manage as well. And that's, to me, that it, was, it became too much to, to go through all that time. I have to ask then, um, with Lock and Load Publishing, do you guys have any ambitions of doing something so, um, pardon the word, but so insanely complicated? <laughs> no, no. Someone will have to tie me up and drug me for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I was in high school and, and uh, after high school, we used to play these monster war games in my parents' garage. And we would spend two days a week in the winter and on the weekend in the um, summer playing. We would play 12, 8, 12, 16 hours straight. And that was great. Um, and we loved it. And I've just, I've kind of lost my thrill for detailed games, you know, super detailed games. I mean, I, I'm going to get yelled at for this, but, you know, ASL, I love Squad Leader. I enjoyed playing it when I was in, in, in high school and when it came out, ASL, it lost me. And, um, you know, it, you have, you, I can't see how you can play really any other game besides that game, kind of like the Pacific War, because you've got a three, 400 page manual at eight point type, you know, double column probably, <laughs> you know, and they're all rules. And, uh, and I'm not, that's not to say it's not a great game. And if you want that, I, I, anyone who asks me, well, do you like your game, Lock and Load or ASL? And they want that complication. I tell them, go to ASL because you're just not going to be satisfied. Um, but I think as you get older, you know, you got wives, you got kids, you got running around to do. Uh, you know, I have no problem keeping a game on my on my table down here for months at a time. And it's a gigantic table. But um, I'm going to believe I am very much in a very small minority of people who can do that. You're a veteran, but I do have to give you some advice from my experience. Don't don't own a cat because uh <laughs> No, not the hard way that I'm a dog person. Yeah. Okay. That might also be dangerous, but he doesn't care. He, yeah. he, he little chips around. He's happy. We, uh, my, uh, my buddy Bob and me were playing uh world in flames. Uh, and he does have a cat and there was a couple of times <laughs> she, she did jump on the, the table and destroy my task forces. And we were kind of like figuring out where, uh, where they were. Um, but when you mentioned uh, like something like that, where with a board game where you have it in, um, uh, that you have it set up down there, uh, it kind of reminded me of the game that I was, had going on with uh, my buddy here, and um, that one he was explaining the rules to me. I think I think we we got together three times in one week. It took two nights to kind of explain the rules to me um, because the World of Flames just had so much um, that was overwhelming. <laughs> And even after I got explained the rules, I just had to kind of go over and over in my mind. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I kind of agree with you because nowadays, you know, uh, I have two little ones now. So, like, the days that I have so many nights to spend doing that are getting less and less and less, um, which is kind of why I love uh, digital games now, like digital board games like what you're doing. Um, I was playing uh, your Civil War game, Victory or Glory, the American Civil War. Right, And uh, I was playing it the other night and I really enjoyed it because I was able to kind of like just jump into the war and I always bypass the tutorials. Like I don't like tutorials. I really don't have the time to spend an hour or two doing a tutorial. So I just jumped right into the game and I was able to pick up the game in probably like five or 10 minutes and play for probably like an hour or two and get through a good chunk of the war, uh, which was awesome because... <laughs> You know, usually I'll have like one or two nights free in a week. And this game was able to kind of like, I was able to get scratched that Civil War itch. Um, the Grand Tactician, which is another game that I'm playing, uh, the Grand Tactician American Civil War. Um, that game I'm still kind of playing and I've devoted probably like five, six, seven hours to it. And it's an hour by hour kind of Civil War game. So I can imagine I'm going to be done with that game probably uh, way into 2022 or something <laughs> like that. Uh, so I really appreciate games that um, allow me to kind of like go start and finish within like one or two days that I have off. Yeah, well that, see, that's, that's where I'm at right now. I, I, I like playing games. Um, I think the, the craziest board game I play right now, and, and my buddies from the company always are trying to get me to play it, is Twilight Imperium. I mean, oh, yeah. you, you have to dedicate a weekend. I mean, we have to set up on Friday night, get here early in the morning, and play until literally 2 or 3, 
everyone goes home, comes back the next day on Sunday, probably about 10, 11 o'clock, and they play until, we, until the game is over. And um, that is probably the longest game I'll play in a sit at this point. I kind of like the new Star Trek Ascendancy. That's great. doesn't take that long, but it's a really good flavor. Um, Star Wars, the Star Wars Rebellion game, oh, yeah. that's great, but that's only two players. I heard it's impossible to win as the uh, – I'm sorry to go off topic, but my buddy was uh, saying that uh, he has that game, and I've been trying to get to play it. But he said it is basically impossible to uh, win as the Rebels in that game. And yeah, I got my ass kicked twice. Don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. I'm, I might have to pick it up myself and uh, try it out because he was just like, yeah, there's no way to win as the Rebels. And I'm like, now, my, my, the guy who's our graphic artist, Blackwell Hurd, that guy is constantly kicking my ass in almost every game we play, and he's kicking everybody's ass. We got so fed up, we were playing um, some Warhammer board game, which is like four players, and the three of us finally just said, whatever we do, we're going to gang up and kill him. And even <laughs> doing that, the three of us ganging up on him, he still barely squ- – we, we beat him barely. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, I have a couple of people like that uh, that I know. I refuse to play with them. <laughs> Well, you know, he just plays better than me, so I don't mind so much. You know, I don't. He doesn't rule me to death. We used to have a guy in the old days, and he would just rule every. You know, he would take his time at work to read the rule book and memorize it, and we would go play with him, and he would, you know, rule us to death. And that I did. He's actually beaten us. So I don't mind this much. <laughs> um. So, kind of getting back to uh, your games, um, because I noticed your digital catalog is getting bigger and bigger, um. And uh, you have a, a large selection of board games. So I'm kind of curious, uh, how do you choose which game that you want to bring over to the digital platform? Like, do you um, kind of go over your entire catalog and um, try to pick one out that would attract the largest audience? Or is it something that you would be like, I know people would love to play this on the computer? How do you make that decision? Um, well, that's usually my decision in the programming team. Um well, Lock and Load Tactical, um, that's programmed by one guy. His name is Tom Proudfoot. He is, uh, I've known him since long, early into the Matrix days. And um, uh, that was basically, we decided right off the top is what's the things that make computer games take so long and cost so much? It's programming, graphics, and um, that was really where it breaks down to in an easy you know, breakdown there. And when we decided to just use the board game graphics and make it a digital um, board game, it took a lot of the problem away. And so because that, that way you don't have to, we said we want the rules to match whenever humanly possible the board game. So what did you do? I handed him the rule book. <laughs> you know, I said, here you go, Tom. These are the rules. Here's your charts and tables. He had everything worked out. And that's why I was saying to you before that, you know, not every program is a designer. You know, and we have tried... When we were at Matrix, we did uh, Empires and Arms. We tried – that's a really great board game. But it was a monster to program as a computer game um, for, you know, many reasons, you know. And so we decided, you know, that was the basis of it. The other thing we did um, when, we were at, when I was at Matrix, the biggest complaint to us was, why don't you make demos? You know, you don't make demos. Any program will tell you the worst thing about making a demo. It's almost like pro, it's almost like breaking the program game because you've got to take the entire game and then deactivate all these special things, not to function. And so no, no programmer ever wants to make a demo for the most part. And so when we, when we got lock and load and one of the first things we decided to do was let's make a chord game. And we call it a core game because what it allows you to do is everything is in the game. It's on one engine, okay? If I decide I want to make it snow, I put snow in the code. Any game that needs to have snow now has it. How many times over the years have you bought a game? Let's see, we'll, we'll pick on the Civil War game, okay? And then there's four more games in the set. But because they keep improving it, sometimes they can't go back and take an improvement from game three and put it into game one. Because they've either changed the engine or they changed the way it was being, or, or, or the, even the language sometimes. So you end up leaving games behind, right? <laughs> this way, what we do is we say, hey, we may think this is the greatest game in the world. You may think it sucks. And that's fine. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. So by making a core game, we kind of make that a demo. It's a full demo, but we only put two or three scenarios in it. And we say, listen, download it. It's for free or it's a dollar. You know, if you can't pay a dollar, 
go away. You know, it's, you know, yeah. and, and, and on Steam, if you don't like it so badly, within 14 days, you can get a full refund. So it yeah. doesn't matter. So, and then what we do is we take and we make everything else DLCs. And um, our logic in that is very simple. By charging between 5 and $15 for DLCs, it's based on how much, bat- I mean, battles you get into it, you know, scenarios. And now instead of saying, well, I want to play that game, but it's 60 bucks and I can't do it. Most people can afford 10, 15 bucks on any given night. I mean, that's probably McDonald's if you're unfortunate. (laughs) (laughs) uh, But a lot, the logic is it was to, to be able to let you try a game out, see if you like it. And if you like it, you got it for five bucks. I mean, that's what the core game for lock of the tactical is. And I believe that's the same thing for heroes of norm and not heroes. Excuse me. Um, Nations at War, um, because we can do the DLCs. Something like Victory and Glory, um, Glenn Dover and James Wachowski, those guys have been working together for a while. He does some great gaming. and um, But that game is, again, something that someone came to us, said, hey, Dave, would you, are you interested? I have new Glenn forever. He does board games too, might I add. And um, we turned around and... Um, we just we just publish that as a regular you know one off game. Now may there be a Civil War game, uh, sorry American Revolution or something else down the line. It might be, but it, again it'll be a complete game at a complete price. Where the DLCs, um, I think there's six planned for Heroes of Normandy, and they have anywhere between eight and fifteen scenarios each in them. What what the, the we want to give you um, variety. Okay, I mean, I think there's 45 scenarios in Heroes of Normandy, the board game. You play each side one. That's basically 90 scenarios. Okay, um, what we're doing it now is we're saying, hey, 10 bucks. Let's just use. I don't know what its price is right now, but I think it's going to be 10 bucks when it's officially released and on early access. In 10 bucks, you're going to get uh, anywhere between, like I said, 10 and 15 scenarios. Now you can either buy the next one and play the next 10 to 15 scenarios, or you can go to Heroes of the Nam, or you can go to Days of Villainy, which is um, fighting in Libya. And so you can jump around and you get a lot more bang for your buck, I feel. I think you're getting a lot more loyalty from the customers as well. Yeah, one uh, thing that uh, you guys are publishing soon, uh, which I'm very, very excited about, is uh, Heroes of the Falklands. Yes, that will come out right after Heroes Against the Red Star, which I'm not going to promise this, and Tom will probably yell at me that I said this, but it should be this week if we're lucky. Oh, you heard her here yeah. first. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you definitely, we're like two months late, but that's like, again, that goes back to the early access. We programmed as much as we could to let you play the early scenarios, and then this was a modern scenario, and Tom had to program all of the fighters and bomber planes in the game and the screens and everything else, and it took us longer than we had hoped. But now that it's in the core engine, any game going forward is already done. One question, since you mentioned uh, the American Revolution, um, one of the questions I had when I was playing this game is, is it possible to use this engine to develop like an American Revolution or Civil War tactical game? Would you be able to do something like that with this kind of engine? Now, I I tend to find that most, uh, James is a, a programmer's programmer. You know, he gets a game from Glenn, the, design, the designer, and he programs it. So I, I don't really believe it's going to – I mean, I could see American Revolution based off of the same system, just changing the historical stuff. I don't see it going to a tactical game. I see them maybe making a tactical game and programming it, um, and that's like you, know, you asking about the process. And sometimes the process is, hey, we want to do this, and we want to make all these DLCs. Um, and programmers love that because they get to work on the same engine without having to throw it away after two years and then move on to a new engine, which usually takes a year or two before the public sees it. So, you know, it's feast or famine. This way, we're giving our content all the time. It's different content, and they get to keep improving the engine that the public keeps to keep updating for free. So and that helps clarify that a little bit. That's uh, that's really awesome. So uh, the uh, everybody who buys the engine is just going to get free updates for that then. The engine will always be a free update. Okay? Um, so, but you, but you only will have, at this point, four scenarios. There's two Vietnam scenarios and there is two um, Normandy scenarios. And they're easy scenarios. They're not made to be 18-hour games or anything like that. They're 
I would say at least, you know, seven turns, five to seven turns each. And you can play either side. So you're not, you know, you're not stuck to just one side. And you can play multiplayer with someone online. So you have some variety there. And the, the real value comes in if you like the system. You can just keep buying these DLCs at anywhere between five and let's say 15 bucks a piece and play more battles. And different types of uh, areas where in the past, you always have to buy a new game. And yeah. so we're trying to get out of that. I really like this model. I, I could. I already saw it when um, the first time I was exposed to lock and load publishing was when I started playing Command Ops. Was your, oh, Command Ops Two, I guess now. Uh, great game, and I saw that you guys put the just the base engine with some sample package missions on Steam for free for people to try. So first of all, if you're listening and you want a really deep command level, operational level, I don't know, tactical, operational level. Yeah, that, that's Dave O'Connor. Um, I've known him, I guess it's 20 years now at least. And um, that has got to be, you know, people always say the AI is weak. I'm, I'll be honest with you. I feel our AI is a little weak and lock and load tactical. Um, but it's, again, you're playing against a computer. It's never going to be as smart as a human. But in Command Ops, that has got to be the best AI I've ever seen in a computer game mm. to this day. It's a great model. Like People can demo the game, and then you know you can just add scenarios. Uh, I think it works well for both people. It's win-win. Well, again, it's the object is we don't want your money unless you're happy. And so you can download it for a couple of bucks, still get a couple of bucks back on Steam. In that case, we did it for free and say, hey, try it out. If you think it's worth the money, buy the battle pack and all the DLC, downloadable content. And that is, um, I think that's a great model because it shows either you believe in what you're producing and you're giving the public a chance to test it. And I I find you make loyal customers when you do things like that. Uh, one question I had about the uh, tactical series, the tactical digital. Um, when I was playing it, I wasn't, uh, I didn't see any PBEM feature. Um, is it possible to do PBEM, or are you planning to add it in the future? Listen, I will add everything in there. The programmers who keep stopping me. <laughs> <laughs> that was rascals. Yeah, the the problem with play by email um, is. Remember what I was saying about um, Empires in Arms? One of the problems with that game when we went to do that was on the board game, you basically move hex to hex to hex to hex to hex. And as you're moving there, any, long, any way along the way, the other player is able to intercept you. Okay, so how do you do that in a play by email game? Okay, because you're going to have to either you're going to have to change the rules or you're going to have to let it basically, if, there's, if you're going through 20 hexes for your fleet, and you want him to be able to intercept anywhere, what is that, going to be 20 exchanges just for that particular aspect of the game? Well, lock on the tactical is the same way. It's an impulse-based system. It's not I go, you go, necessarily. So it becomes much better to play live online than it does play by email. I'm not going to say we're going to do it, but I'm not going to say we're definitely not. I don't find it likely. Um the other problem also is you have to find a way to get the files back and forth um, to each other. And you know what? The funny thing is, how many of you guys have played Steel Panthers, World at War, or Steel Panthers ever? I think I've played a few times. Not recently. Okay. Those games, people used to cheat like crazy on. They would take files, open it up, change the factors of their units, resave it, play the turns. Um, yeah. We, we actually had to come up with some creative ways with we're in the Pacific to stop that. And what we did was we locked all the scenario. So let's say the first 10 scenarios were in the Pacific. Those are locked. You can't edit those. Now, you could open them up and save it in slot 11 and above, but you can't save it in slot 1 through 10. And the reason we did that was because people were cheating. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so that, that was the way we got around it. Um, but still... I don't see it happening because of the type of style. Like if it was I go, you go, where the person does all of his moves, you you watch the combat, and then the other person goes, yeah, I can see that happening. But right now, all of our computer games, well, the, except for Command Ops and uh, Victory and Glory, are based off the board games. And since board games are notoriously, you know, I go, you go, or an impulse-based system, I don't see play by email working very well. Well, I kind of have a question about this because you've, you're such a veteran of the war game industry and moving to PC, I think moving to just any kind of simulation engine, the one advantage I see is that now you have the opportunity to do WeGo 
which to me is, I, I, f- I find this the most interesting. And it's how War in the Pacific works, right? Which yeah. is not something, I, I don't know any tabletop games that do we go because it would require some referee or arbiter to like <laughs> take the decisions from both people. It, it almost have to be like a Dungeons and Dragons type thing where you had a, a DM. But uh, have you guys, or what's your experience moving from, people moving from I go, you go to, to we go? Or your thoughts on that? Um, I don't think people have really problems with that. People had real problem with real time when it came out. You know, Orcs versus Humans, I think, was the first one that came out. Um, and I think because you have no time to think, you have to be ready to click, <laughs> you know, move and all that. I think as far as we go and I go, I have no problem with it on the computer, personally. And I kind of enjoy that because you kind of um, battle a brick in uh, SSI, a Gary Grisby game. I love that game, but that game is, you know, basically the German player plots all of his bombing missions against the British. You take off, and then you basically sit there as a German player. But it's so enjoyable because the British player has to react to your bombing groups coming over. He doesn't know if that's the first one, the last one, one of 50, 100. You know, he has no way of knowing. And I don't like that type of stuff in, in, in my computer games. Um, so I think you'll see stuff like that from us. But those will be have to be geared to that from the get go. Um, the thing that the programmers have told me, the guys doing Nations at War, um, if you know anything about our board games, uh, World of War 85, we did a phenomenal Kickstarter for that last year. Um, that game is basically a, a version of Nations at War, which is a World War II edition of that engine in 1985. And um, what makes it so much easier for the programmers is to be given a, a well-rounded, well-tested um, system that has all the maps, all the counters, all the rules, and all the scenarios. All they have to do is program. I say all, but it, you know, it, it, it cuts down so much work on their part. Yeah, I can see the Wego system being a little more complicated because it, it requires interactions with moving parts in the like subturns. Anyway, I mean, it, it's it's interesting. Um, also, just a note, John, David. I have to step off, so I'll let you guys continue the interview. But, David, it was, it was a real pleasure. A real pleasure here, too. Okay. Take care, guys. So I want to kind of uh, – I just have one last question for me, and then uh, I guess I will take um, questions from the audience, uh, from uh, you guys in the chat room. So feel free to post any questions you want me to a- uh, ask. Um, the one question I had is – my last question, I guess, is do you plan to add a scenario editor for the uh, for Tactical Digital in the future? Yes, it will be a battle generator, okay? And that's what it's called now. It's, if you look at the board games, you'll see it's already there. And um, it will be added. It won't be added until we're done a lot of the scenarios because we have to have all the engine fully functionable, fully set up to go before you do the battle generator. Okay, that's exciting because, uh, you know, I do want to play around with the <laughs> some of the uh, uh, scenarios and, uh, you know, uh, I like I like being the underdog in a lot of the scenarios. It makes the victory uh, just more uh, sweeter. <laughs> um, and then I have two questions from a fan um, by the name of Bill who uh, has one qu- – oh, well, two questions. He says, um, any plans for expanding play in World War II Pacific Theater? On a particular, is he asking about a particular series or is this asking in general? I think in general. Um, well, we do have uh, Heroes of the Pacific and Lockalo Tactical, which will be coming. I, Nations at War, we do have a Pacific edition of that. Believe it or not, we just haven't really decided when to release that yet. So pretty much I hope that answers the question. <laughs> That's exciting. I, I saw Nations at War. That's actually my next play. So um, I'm a big uh, fan of the Pacific. So I'm definitely going to be um, hitting the buy button for that one. <laughs> uh, and then his other question was, your last podcast was in September 2019. Any plans to pick it up again? Yeah, um, that's on me, guys. Um, I had surgery at the end of July. Uh, they had to do, they had, I had some tumors and stuff they moved around or got rid of, actually. And they said, oh, four or five days, you'll be back in your feet. It's eight weeks later. And this is the first, I think, I think I did one other interview for a little bit um, about a week ago, maybe a week and a half ago. Um, so it's just been, I've been exhausted and have not really been able to work. So, um, yeah, we're going to pick them up. 
Um, we did do the Mo interviewed me for the virtual con last week, which is somewhere out on the internet. And Devin and I did like a real five, 10 minute thing just to introduce the con last. I think that was also last week. But yeah, there'll be more coming. Devin's uh, the original OG. He's my um, looking to get me back on the horse there with that. <laughs> I didn't even know you guys had a podcast. And I was just like, when I saw the question, I'm like, wait, they have a podcast? So for those who may not know us, we have a YouTube channel. Okay. It's on our page. And there's all, all kinds of. Uh, helpful tips. We actually do video rule books. So if you don't know Lock and Load Tactical, Nations at War, World at War, the series, you're not forced to read the rule book. You can go and use what we call our boot camp. Those are done by the Gimpy Gamer who has his own podcast and his podcasts are great too. He actually took our manual and he actually took each chapter of the rules and made a video of it, explaining the rules. And so you can, and it's, you know, it's not to replace the rule book, but it's a great way of learning the rules without having to read the entire rule book. Um, and each video is probably under three minutes. And we did that on purpose, you know, not to bore anybody, you know, 50 minute, one section. Um, that's one thing. We also, our manuals are free to download. So if you go to our webpage and go to resources, all of our manuals, you can download for free PDF, EPUB, even have audio books. Okay. I'm not seeing the audio books the best way to learn, <laughs> okay? But in case you just want to listen to the rule book as you're driving to work, you can do that. So, and then, we, of course, we have um, the, the podcast is really more of a video cast. Remember we were talking about the stream yard before? Yes. Yeah, that's what, that's what we use for that. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm definitely going to have to take a look at that. That sounds really uh, um, more, much more efficient than <laughs> maybe what we're doing. Uh, and then I have... Uh, Finnish ja uh, Jaguar um, mentioned in the chat, he says, we've seen other publishers create programs to support indie devs trying to create and publish war games. Uh, does or will Lock and Load Publishing be doing something similar? Well, I never say never. Um, I can't honestly tell you I have anything set in stone. Um, I don't know if you guys are on Steam. There's the Tabletop Simulator and Tabletopia. Um, one of the things that I think is going to happen um, is board gaming, especially with the pandemic, has been really quick, you know, stopped. I mean, stores are closed. You can't play in stores. I mean, um, we took all of our board games, all of our series board games, and put one scenario onto Tabletop Simulator with all the pieces, all the maps, and, and, and one scenario. We even put the, we have a solo kit for our board games. So if you you know, not into computers and you just want to play by yourself, um, a lot of people just play both sides. That's not me. So we um, got this card system from Academy Games. They're nice enough to lend this to, uh, license it to us. We modified it, and now you can play one side with the cards against you as the person. Well, the reason I'm bringing that up is a lot of people can't lug a board game with them on their trips to travel in for work. So now you can get onto Tabletop Simulator it's anywhere between 10 and 20 bucks on Steam. And um, then you can download for free our game. Now, key to this is if you don't own anything, own any of our products, you're only going to be able to play one or two scenarios, okay? But every game is there. And the rules are free to download. So you really don't have to invest much in anything. If you already own the game, the board game, you don't need anything because you already have all the scenarios in the board game. You can take one book with you, throw it in your suitcase like a magazine, and play online, save it, and come back to it whenever you want. And I kind of think that's going to be the new rage. I think a lot of board game is going to turn into digital, where, hey, I can't play with Eugene, but let's hop online. We can play two hours of Lock and Load Tactical, and it's it looks and acts like a board game. It's not as, let's say, convenient as being in front of a board game, but it really is I mean, it's really something to check out if you haven't looked at yet. Yeah, that's one thing I really loved about um, about um, Tactical Digital is because when I was playing it, I felt like, you know, a lot of games that go from board games uh, to desktop games, you know, they lose that uh, board game flavor. Um, you know, uh, there's a couple that come to mind. But when I was playing this game and uh, there's a war game, I felt like, honestly, like this was a board game just on my computer screen you know it, it everything felt just like that and uh i really appreciated it cons considering that you know i haven't been 
able to play any board game since way before this pandemic started, uh, which, you know, feels like a lifetime now. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is a huge thing. And I'm, I'm glad that you guys are pub- uh, porting a lot of these games to the digital platform. Well, the, the nice thing about it is a lot of um, gamers can't afford to keep 30 games on their shelves. And when you're on Steam, you don't have that shelf problem. With the Tabletop Simulator and Tabletopia, uh, definitely more Tabletop Simulator in my opinion, um, you don't have to buy the board games anymore. You can download our rules. You can you buy the scenario module rules. That's how we make our money, to be quite frank. And then you're good to go. You can play every single scenario that's in a box game on the digital platform for basically 30 bucks. So you support the company and you have your entire board game library digitally. There is one thing that I, I, I feel like we do lose when we have Steam games is I miss getting my hands on like the box art. Uh, <laughs> Because, you know, a lot of these board games, and uh, I really love just getting the actual box and just, like, looking at the uh, box art. It is it is quite um, uh, satisfying, you know, to actually pick it up uh, in your hands. When I see my Steam catalog, I'm, you know, I look at it, I'm like, all right, I'm going to move for this. But there's a lot of times, like, I love going through my friend's catalog. We And we don't play a lot of them because some of them take days or weeks to play. But I love just picking it up and going through the rule book. It... it, 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 it I feel like that's something that uh, I miss. <laughs> I Like I said, I have hundreds of games on Steam. I probably have what, 500 board games in my house that I, I purchased and I kept, and I just sold like 300 of them over the last year. I got rid of the old ones and kept, I still have about 500 board games. During this pandemic, I must have bought at least six games, you know, uh, through Kickstarters and or just deals on Consim World online. No, I get it. But what's nice about it is you can play... Like I said, our goal is to get you to play our games any which way we can. So if you want to play on the computer, you want to play a digital board game on through Tabletop Simulator, you, I don't want to have board games. I want to have the board games. I, I hope we've kept all the options open for you. And that's why we did the manual. The manual, you can buy Spiral Bound. You can download it. It's an audio book. It's an EPUB book. Again, it's to get you to play. And that, if you're not playing the game, you're not, you're not being a real publisher in my opinion. Yeah. So I, that's all my questions. Um, and I think we took care of all the questions from the chat and the ones I got an email. Um, well, uh, David, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, I love everything that you guys are doing. I really honestly just, uh, am thrilled, uh, especially with, uh, tactical digital because, uh, yeah, I think it's a great value. It's, uh, I mentioned in my review, I was like, this is $5. It's basically a cup of coffee at Starbucks and you get hours and hours of, uh, uh, gameplay. So I, I love that. And I, I want to say thank you for doing that. And, um, uh, Steve, did you say you have a KS question? Uh, he wrote the KS question, uh, Kickstarter. Oh, yeah. He says the Kickstarter schedule or Kickstarter question. The kick, What we're going to do with Kickstarter is we were supposed to have Kickstarters out, but of course the pandemic started. Um, we're going to have anywhere between two and four Kickstarters done, one behind each behind the other. Oh. Um, I'm going to, I mean, I'm not going to say which one's first because honestly, the designers are fighting with each other to get to be done first. <laughs> um, they're all basically done. Um, there's the World at War is going to have two kickstarters guys we're going to have um blood and fury and we're going to have um we shall stand there'll be more on that coming for up point blank is a basically tactical squad card game okay um and then there's other games which i'm not going to go into but they're, they're right there ready to go really right now what we're doing is we're trying to find a non-chinese based company printer um, I think uh, between the United States and China arguing over the COVID-19, which is a fair argument from my point of view, um, but you never know what's going to happen. And regardless of who wins the presidency, I mean, the two Kickstarters we did um, was delayed almost six months, I believe, is what we finally ended up because they were afraid of a trade war. And that was only at 25 percent. And it took weeks to go from the dock to the boat. Then the boat went from, you know, going normally going right to America to going down the entire Chinese coastline and taking another month to get here. 
Once it got here, it took almost a month to go from the boat onto the train to get it to a, a truck place to go through customs to get to us. So we're trying to eliminate that because I'm a little nervous. Um, honestly, if we'll, you know, will the games be able to get here if something you know geopolitical starts? Um, but the games are going to be coming very, very soon in Kickstarter. We already have them set up on the Kickstarter page. Um, it's just a matter of um, you know securing the printer where we feel comfortable that we, we get the stuff that we're paying for. I'll definitely link that in the uh, show notes. So, um, and I'll uh, publish all the links uh, in the show notes too. So anybody listening, uh, you can definitely go into the podcast show notes and I'll, li- I'll link it there. I guess that does it for me. Uh, did you have anything else that you wanted to cover, David? No, oh, hey, Gene, I really appreciate you asking me to come on. And uh, thank you guys for having me. And, you know, any other time you want to do something like this, let me know. Awesome. Um, and uh, so I, I'll keep in touch and uh, we'll look forward to uh, the next uh, interview. All right. Take care.